This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Off Planet Radio. My name is Randy Moggins and uh, welcome to another edition. Uh, I'm beyond thrilled at the lineup that we have for this show. Two people who uh, come from backgrounds of very deep research, investigation, personal integrity, um, a grasp on what is really going on in the realm of uh, the wide spectrum of metaphysics, spirituality, uh, advancement of human consciousness, and what we're going to talk about in the first hour as well, which is what the hell is going on with uh, ufology, as it's called. That would be the study of unidentified flying objects and uh, various things in the sky. And none of this is what you think it is. And I want to present on our show tonight, returning again, Mr. James Bartley from uh, the Cosmic Switchboard.com. Hello, Randy. Hello, Bernard. Uh, pleased to be here. And uh, we have James, of course, is, uh, is uh, on the down under, so we got a little bit of signal lag. We'll deal with that. And for the first time, we welcome Mr. Bernard Gunther to our show. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference, Bernard, your website, uh, veilofreality.com, but if you have another site that's a better contact place, let us know. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Hey, James. Good to see you on as well. Likewise. I am honored to have you guys on, especially together, because um, I think we all kind of have this wheelhouse that we operate in, and sometimes we, we connect with um, different people at different times, and this was an opportune moment. Um, kicking things around as we did in the social space at Facebook about some of the go goings on in, in ufology right now, there is this, there has been for years now, this dwindling effect on ufology in terms of what its core mission was, which goes back many decades. For me, it probably goes back about 20 years, at least in terms of formally probing into it, but it's a lifetime search for me. And I've watched as it has evolved and now devolved into what has basically become a dog and pony show that um, underpins very large events like Contact in the Desert, where it seems to me like it's become more of a venue for spinning of fantasies and wild-eyed conjecture and selling of books and media without a whole lot of meat on the bone anymore. And it seems like we should be further down the road because we're almost 80 years down the road on this now in terms of large-scale UFO events that have been occurring in the Western nations, not just the United States, but Europe as well. I and mean, if you go back and you look at the history of this, obviously pre-World War, post-World War I, uh, these events were going on. But if we consider the invasion of L.A. in World War II, the UFO flap over D.C. in the 50s. I live here in the Northeast Corridor, not too far from Washington, D.C., about 110 miles. We had UFO flaps here when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. So we've had serious confirmation of what's going on in the sky, going on 50 years just from our life perspective, and yet we're making no progress in this area. So... Um, yeah. Some of this goes into recent releases of documents by some high-profile UFO researchers and some documents that have been released onto the Internet. Uh, Admiral Wilson documents stating basically that um, even high-end military officers have been denied access to uh, what is perceived to be the corporate interests in extraterrestrial craft. So maybe I'll let James kind of kick this off because I think, I think he was kind of uh, locked and loaded to go on this. So first round to you, James. Thank you, Randy. 
what I see with this faux disclosure that's going on is it it neatly omits, as you just stated, Randy, what has gone on for well over 70, 80 years now. This cover-up has been maintained at times with brute force, using a compliant corporate media to ridicule witnesses, uh, pilots, both civilian airline pilots as well as military pilots have been uh, sworn to secrecy, intimidated, debriefed. And just to add some perspective, because the Navy pilot uh, video has been in the news for some time now, the, yeah. the notion of jet chases of UFOs is nothing new. And I'm going to read something from Filer's Files website, the National UFO Center, which I was aware of first when I read Tim, Timothy Good's excellent book, uh, The UFO Cover-Up. Yes. You bring Top up Secret Timothy Good. Good. That's, yeah, absolutely go. And it's a quote from General Chidlaw, who was the air defense commander at one time in the, um, well, decades ago. And this is a quote from this Air Force general responsible for Eastern Air Defense for the Air Defense Command. Quote, we have stacks of reports about flying saucers. We take them seriously when you consider we have lost many men and planes trying to intercept them. And also, in the body of this literature, in these archives and in these quotes, there were statements to the effect that on average, during a certain period of time, they were losing an average of a plane a day trying to chase after these UFOs. And then you look at what happened in the aftermath of, of Roswell. If we want to use Roswell as a base, baseline starting point, the family of Sheriff George Wilcox, who was at one of the crash sites, his deputies were at the crash sites, and apparently Sheriff George Wilcox had seen some of the alien bodies. He was told in no uncertain terms by the military that if he breathed the word of this to anybody, not only would he be killed, not only his children would be killed, but his grandchildren would be killed. And then you have the story of Frankie Rowe, who was a young girl at the time of Roswell. She held some of the Roswell material in her hand. We've all heard stories about the, the metallic material, the metallic yeah. uh, material that had the uh, tensile memory where it would be crushed yes. and then it would flatten itself out. She was told and intimidated basically by a military police officer not to tell anyone or in so many words, she would disappear. They would take her out to the desert. No one would ever see her again. It traumatized her for her whole life. And those are just two examples. Uh, we talk about the pilots again. Uh, Commander Graham Bethune, a, a Navy, a Naval aviator who passed away some years ago, was public about his UFO experiences for decades. Another former uh, pilot, a military pilot, Guy Kirkwood, who I knew personally, an Air Force pilot in the early 1950s, he was part of a team that was trained specifically to intercept UFOs and, and record the intercept on gun camera film. Now, fast forward years later, and there were a number of times when he was harassed by the CIA in the 1960s. Fast forward to the time when Stephen Greer was putting together his... Uh, big meeting there press at the conference. National Press Club. Yeah. Exactly. The pre the, well, Guy Kirkwood was one of the people that were invited to that. And Guy Kirkwood would have gone there. He would have been one of the ex-military people to talk about that. But unfortunately, he received a phone call from an unnamed person who said if he goes to this meeting, he will find out that he won't have a home to go back to because they will burn his house down. Okay. So this is the level of secrecy intimidation that we're talking about. And so what I want to see, any kind of disclosure has to include compensation, vindication, uh, and a memorial to all the people who've been harassed, ridiculed, uh, disappeared, murdered. I mean, that just brings it down to the baseline level. We're not just talking about Navy jets and their woo-woo videos, and we've heard about these jet interceptor uh, UFO chases for decades now. It's nothing new to any of us. And another thing also, there's been a large schism within the UFO community for a long time where there has been this separation between UFO investigations, usually involving sighting reports of UFOs in the sky, landing trace reports, et cetera, et cetera. And that seemed to be distinct from the actual encounter experiences. Well, people like 
us would have yeah. actual face-to-face -face encounters with ETs. And for a long time now, those reports had been swept under the rug, marginalized, and now, and we can talk more about this later, because of the intelligence community creation of the New Age movement, all of that has been swamped over by the New Age now, where we're not even allowed to talk about alien abduction experiences because yeah. these New Agers will get offended uh, because it's too negative. And so there's layer upon layer upon layer of denial, secrecy, and what have you. So there's nothing new about this whole concept of UFOs and military knowledge of the same. We need to bring it back to the baseline of, of, of the key events, the Roswell crash, Aztec uh, crash, et cetera, et cetera, and, and then move forward from there. Uh, that way we once again reclaim these investigations and these studies to ourselves instead of relying on this once again military priesthood who we will rely upon to tell us what they want us to know when these are the same people who've been lying to us, who've been intimidating witnesses, who've been harassing witnesses, who've used the corporate media to ridicule people. So that's how I feel about uh, the UFO scene. Uh, Bernard, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. 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 No, no. Thank you. Thank you, James. Because I, it's so true. I, you know, all this information is coming out recently as well. It's nothing new, right? There's so much of the same in different disguises. And what I've noticed as well, um, you know, we've got to the disclosure. There's always like some period all of a sudden the disclosure is coming closer and closer and something will be revealed and whatnot. And, you know, recently we saw that. I mean, that's why the three of us get, were getting together. There was just a week ago, right, when people in the Senate were briefed and even Trump were briefed about UFOs and uh, encounters of uh, the Navy and whatnot. You know, it made headlines on the CNN. And interestingly, on the exact same day when that was published on CNN, Bob Lazar was on, uh, uh, on Joe yeah. Rogan, which on is Rogan. huge. I mean, considering Joe Rogan being literally the most popular podcast in the world with millions of views, right? And yeah. Bob Lazar's, you know, something to be said seems to be legit and who knows what's exactly happened. But it's so interesting that, you know, there's no such thing as a coincidence, right? And, you know, but I always see this, this carrot of disclosure, disclosure coming soon, right? And we see this in the new age with various figureheads always promising disclosure and cosmic disclosure and all of that. And it's being promoted at all these events. Um, but it's almost this dangling carrot, right? And with all this information, what, I'd have, what I've noticed, and I've been part, not part, but back in the days when I started researching like uh, in the 90s, and then early 2000, I went to various UFO conferences, right, here and there, and was just also, you know, fascinated by this topic, you know. And then back then, I also wasn't, I can almost, you know, I took the New Age pill at some point myself, so to speak, because you're just so fascinated by these topics and you don't want to, it becomes like an escape from, from reality, right? So you want to believe, you want certain things to be true so badly. And I remember clearly when Stephen Greer, had this press conference that was like 2001 or something um if, you know all the disclosure, disclosure. Press club yeah it, exactly yeah. and i i i swallowed it like holy shit this is amazing and spread the word and like disclosure is coming soon and soon you know until i started researching this whole phenomena deeper myself and what i realized what james just mentioned there's a lot of things that are not, that are denied or not mentioned you know, in ufology in general or in the new age or in the disclosure movement, which is the taboo topic of alien abduction, right? And yep. especially for in my personal research, how this UFO phenomenon ties into the hyperdimensional eight matrix, interdimensional beings, you know, and how deceptive these forces can be and, and appear in all kinds of disguises, shapes, and forms. And then I also came across the topic of COINTELPRO, counterintelligence programs, which is, I think, very, very important to consider and understand and understand how disinformation works. Because disinformation is not just lies. It's just very clever truth mixed with lies, right? It's like the shit sandwich, so to speak. So they can yeah. give away little bits of truth, you know, pack it, pack it you know, between the two shit sandwiches, so to speak, and then they, they swallow the lies as well and divert them off the path. You know, and it's so difficult to research because, you know, even all these whistleblowers uh, that have come to 
you know, to speak out and dis uh, disclose information. Sometimes also you don't know is the you know if they are speaking the truth. They're conscious content pro agents, really implants. But also something I call unconscious content pro agents, like people who are out of because of their own personality issues or whatnot. You know, ego, narcissism, what you know, needing popularity, fame, um, are attached to a certain view and promote disinformation unintentionally, but still feed into the agenda so to speak and then when it comes to disclosure i always have to ask who's to, who's going to disclose what because in my personal research that the government itself you know especially the public government doesn't really have much clue of what is truly going on so if you're waiting for an official statement of the official government to disclose the evolved phenomena we can wait a long time or whatever that disclosure will be it will be definitely full of distortions and lies and towards a whole different agenda so. Yeah, well, so part of it right now is this schism that's occurred, and I will say since 2016 was the perfect storm, um, a number of things happened. One of them is, and you can't talk about it without bringing this up, was the introduction to UFOlogy and the mingling of secret space program with UFOlogy which occurred when David Wilcock and Corey Good began rolling out their dog and pony show through Gaia. And what happened there over the course of about 18 months, and that's high watermark, was this major confrontation between testimony and, and what you would call hard evidentiary materials. Um, <clears throat> Corey Good made, Corey Good made extremely extravagant claims about secret space program, about 20 and back programs, about um, uh, these corporate entities that were running off world, I guess you would call them human mining operations, basically it was trafficking of humans for use as labor on other worlds and things like that. Mixed in with that came the new age, the blue avian meme that was introduced, which obviously was a mind virus unleashed to hook into earlier material that has been released by David Wilcock over, over years. The raw material, which was brought out by Carla Rucker back in what, the 70s, 80s, um, which mingled again the ufology scene with this Black Projects operation, compartmentalized operations thing, and brought in a spirituality, again, of what I call, call a savior program. Mm -hmm. And in, in the period of that 18 months, I watched as this thing unfolded. It became a cult. It became a hostile cult. James and I were talking about this before uh, the show, how everything gets bifurcated. How basically people take sides and then those sides are played off against each other, which is very much a COINTELPRO operation too. So the sum of this to me came down to the point where people called bullshit on people like Corey Good. Corey Good became the poster boy for all of the people out there who were making claims, which they lacked evidentiary proof for, but had what I consider to be within the body of the work consistent testimony. And the result of that was this schism that occurred where one side basically said, we reject anybody who does not bring forward their bona fides, that they will not be accepted unless they can prove their experience. This basically discarded a huge body of work that had been done with and by survivors of my lab's projects, ET abductions, what are called hybrid programs, and other experiences where people have bearing in their, in their memory and in their consciousness of traumatic events that are attributable to what we would call off-world influences. That was all thrown out and they said from now on, we want reliable source documents, uh, we want hard proof. And the amazing thing about this is there has been a complete drought of hard proof of anything for two years in ufology. 
nothing, literally a drip until this current leakage came out, which is really not much of anything, but it was an updraft for the ufology once again to begin what I call the chatter in the background. But really, what we've done is we've bifurcated the movement. I have said to various researchers I interact with, the people who have hard proof of any kind, documentation, photography, um, materials research, because there are materials researchers out there who possess what is called alien artifacts. We need them and we need the people who are experiencers and we need to begin to work together to build a body of evidence that's both evidentiary and testimony. The community has basically been split so that now we have two communities who don't talk to each other anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, uh, Randy. What I see happening is, well, you've probably seen something similar where there's these uh, divisions, these fracture lines that have been created. And the Corey Good faction, let's say, they seem to be almost like this Antifa social justice warrior uh, aspect or version of real people who've come out and have had experiences. Because I, I see weird pathologies with the, the Antifa Corey Good movement. We know that when anyone steps out, especially someone famous, an actor, actress, or an academic, steps out and publicly, whether it's in the Twitterverse or in the media, says something contract, uh, contrasting uh, or against these prevailing fake narratives, these, these fake consensuses put out by the universities and the media, we know that the corporate media will jump all over the people. We know that the Twitterverse will jump all over the people. All these attack bots will materialize out of nowhere and just start harassing the people who've come forward, who've talked about things that are contrary to these fake narratives that are being pushed. Now, I see the same thing with the Antifa social justice warrior Corey Good group, where anyone criticizes them, out of nowhere, these attack bots pop up. <laughs> so, so that tells me, at some level, that Corey Good and his message, they're a protected species. Each one of us here have had our share, un- unfair share, of critics that have raked us over the coals for no reason. They don't know us. They don't know our work, right? Right. But we don't have all these attack bots popping up and, and harassing those people, emailing them, uh, phoning them, uh, putting out smear campaigns. So that tells me that Corey Good and his message is a protected, protected species at some level. And, and also, I've always been suspicious of anything, whether it's being put out by the corporate media or the alternative media, let's say, that has a high emotional content. Because what happens is reason, uh, reason debate, uh, dialogue, normal rational dialogue, that's left by the wayside. And in its place, it's replaced by uh, name-calling, mudslinging, et cetera, et cetera. And right before we came on, Bernard, uh, Randy and I were talking about whether anyone believes in the flat earth or not, that's entirely their issue. I don't have any qualms about people believing in anything. But what I see with the flat earth movement is not only is it infiltrational in nature. Okay, I know that alien abductions are real. I know that military abductions are real. That doesn't give me the right to go onto a natural health website and start screaming about alien abductions, screaming about military abductions, and uh, accusing everyone on the natural health website of being a disinfo artist if they don't believe what I believe. Right, yeah, the shill attack, yeah. The shill attack, because that, again, it... It smacks of the Maoist Red Guards. It smacks of the Soviet-era agitprop, uh, agitation propaganda. Everything is of a high emotional content. Everyone's offended easily, mm-hmm. right? And so we see that dynamic with the Flat Earth Movement. And what's interesting also is how the Flat Earth Movement is even merged with elements of the New Age community, which you would think are polar opposites because when you get right into it, the flat earth is is a message of extreme despair and hopelessness because one of the things they have to um, invoke in order to explain away why the skies in the northern and southern hemisphere and the constellations are different is that we live beneath a dome 
And if we live beneath a dome, the real underlying message is, well, folks, you live in a terrarium. You live in a goldfish uh, bowl, all right? So forget about it. Forget about hope. Forget about destiny. Forget about anything, right? That's the real message. But somehow that's merged with a new age community, at least here in Australia. And I've also seen how the flat earth has merged with the chemtrail uh, um, activist group. So the point I'm making, the point of relevance is when that high emotional content is present, as is the case with the Antifa social justice warrior, Corey Good uh, faction, then I, that tells me right off the bat that there is this agitprop, uh, consumal malice kind of mentality at work. And so we need to get it back, like Randy said, to the point where we're having rational discussions, we're bringing real information to the table. And another point I'd like to quickly make, and I'd like Bernard's thoughts on this and your thoughts, Randy, also, is you made a brilliant point the other day on Facebook, Randy, about how so many people have become, in effect, YouTube zombies. They go onto mm -hmm. YouTube and they watch podcast after po uh, listen to interview after interview, podcast after podcast. It's all outward projection because, unfortunately, you know, we're of an age, us three, where before the internet, we had to be researchers, we had to be archivists, we had to be readers. Mm -hmm. And the succeeding generations that came after us, they didn't have that ethic. And so they outwardly project and they look for all these people. It's an aspect of the savior programming. And they look for all these people with all these answers. And then the search algorithms drive them to Corey Good's information. It drives them to, and like Bernard pointed out, whether a person is complicit, willingly, consciously aware of the disinformation they're putting out, or they're a useful idiot, you know, the old KGB term, right? A useful idiot. The search algorithms will reflect that. Oh, wow, this person is a useful idiot. Let's boost up their views. Let's drive uh, the, uh, the search algorithms in their direction. So again, it, it comes back to going old school, reading the old stuff about UFO cases. I know it's tedious. I know it's a process. But only then do we have this baseline of understanding. And then, then we begin to go inward and we decide and we determine inwardly, okay, what out there has relevance and meaning for me? Not, not anything to do with this outward disclosure. How does, mm. what can I do looking for information that will help me and, you know, because we're all captains of our own ship. So anyhow. Yeah. Bernard, um, Bernard, please yeah. go ahead and respond to Thank that. you. Um, no, James, some excellent points, and I really uh, like your analogy to social justice warriors or the, the political climate we're in right now, because that really, what I see in the alternative movement, alternative media or UFO movement, is not much different than what's happening in the mainstream. You know, in the alternative media, it's also all of a sudden driven by sensationalism. You know, how can I bring the news information, draw in, I mean, with Guy and all of this, draw in more viewers, get them hooked on more information. And like I mentioned before, I can almost relate to the mindset when I was at youth conferences, you want to hear the news, like, you know, experience or uh, insight from the latest whistleblower and whatnot, you know. And then you have people like, you know, I remember when I first came across David Wilk, it was 2007, 2008, I even subscribed to his newsletter. But then he was, it was so much information, I was actually amazed how much disinformation can be packed in one newsletter. And always these continuing like, predictions and disclosure coming soon. And these, you know, I have these sources which I cannot disclose and tell me that. And I had a dream working with Obama and we, the, Obama's going to help us disclose UFO information. All of that, literally, he predicted back 2008, 2009, obviously didn't happen. So it's always, again, this gang of carrots. So people want this, 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 this emotional um, satisfaction and it ties also into what you guys both mentioned the savior program which is more and more coming from something outside is going to help us finally some change finally there will disclosure and everything will be better it ties into Stephen Greer and alien technology and uh, zero point energy and you know that the aliens are hiding from us so we just have to you know uh, welcome them so they can save us from ourselves so to speak so it's, it's always this narrative right and then what I've seen over the recent years exactly this what do you mention in the flat earth, whatever movement, which I personally, I don't care what people's view is, but it is in a sense a psyop with the intention of divide and conquer, right? And that's for me the modus operandi of the matrix on all levels, from the, even from the hidden 
scenes from a cult from a cold perspective, which is, you know, what I focus on more, the hyperdimensional, hyperdimensional aspect and forces working through people and pitting us against each other, right? And we definitely see this in the alternative movement, in the UFO movement. And really to bring it down on the basic level, like similar, like what you mentioned, James, with, you know, the social justice warrior and this emotional intensity and just fighting each other, it just comes down to basic psychology. There's this externalization of everything and no internal reflection right and internal like what you know that's that's what i've also asked in my own work and you know my own work i mean we all can agree like it keeps always evolving wherever we are it's also a reflection where we are at right um but at some point with all this stuff out there what's happening you have always alien saviors blue avians you know what is the point of it all why why are we doing what we're doing right so it really like at some point you have to also look within yourself and check yourself um, how we take in information, right? Have this objective observer almost in the sense like, which is part of, like, like you guys mentioned before, have a reasonable debate with reason, but also emotional intelligence. And that's so lacking in this day and age, right? And then people latch on these ideas and this hive mind thinking. And you know, I noticed that too, you know, when I criticized, you know, uh, Corey Good and whatnot and dealing with the attacks, from uh, his, you know, fan culture and whatnot. Um, it's just this, this attachment to an image that people have, but people want to be uh, true so badly, but has no really no foundation. And, you know, like, again, like also what, what James mentioned, what you mentioned and also Randy in your last post about how people take in information nowadays, right? It is about YouTube clips and just watching something for 10, 15 minutes and hardly anybody is truly reading something, doing research. You know, when I started out, you know, like I mentioned in my nineties or, you know, I had to read books, I had to read documents. I, there was no YouTube or anything like that, right? Or it was really hard to come by even certain information. And nowadays it's so oversaturated, right? So I think for the most part, people are, you know, there are a lot of quote unquote useful idiots, you know, and a lot of people can spread this information unknowingly. But that's for me, where I come from, it's really important then this inner work, like our own inner you know, uh, alignment with ourselves, with who we are and our soul development, our emotional intelligence, our base understanding, basic critical thinking, and all of that communication needs to go hand in hand with the quote unquote outer research, right? So we cannot separate the two. And I see too much, um, again, what I see ha seeing a lot in the alternative movement in the UFO moves and even youthology and conference are popping up here and there it's a sensationalism right yeah well there's a hive mind that comes into play with all of this uh, i'm going to go back to what something you both kind of touched on and that is this cyber culture and this was kind of the key behind some of the things that i write about on a weekly basis we're being driven now by algorithms we're being driven by data, and we're not being driven by the innate human quest to be able to process information on a human scale. I, and I've said this for years, when we enter the computer age, going back to the 80s, but certainly by the time of the 90s, by the time we got to the advent of the internet and what that became in terms of a platform to present things in a multimedia hypertext context, we began the assault on our own processing systems. The analog between the human and the computer is not lost on me. That the computer is very much an analog of the human processing in terms of having a central processor, the brain, and then the memory banks and the hard disk drive, and we're processing information generally from a top-down mode of thinking, largely left-brain dominant, and largely moving now at increasingly, increasingly faster rates of data. Rates that we were never designed to process. And the density of the information, it's information. It's garbage in, garbage out, old programmer's code. But basically, what happens is it doesn't matter what's in that data load. You are processing the data load in blocks, whether it contains truth or lies or emotions 
or whatever contextual process is underlying it. We have to process all of this in a data stream. And as people increasingly have begun to use this as their primary means of ex accessing information, they've become attenuated to the speed of the information without being able to properly process it either in terms of context or their own emotional landscape. And these algorithms on the level that are being operated, especially on a platform like YouTube, are designed to key off of things like the number of link clicks that you are making, the number of times that you're moving between suggested views. The whole algorithm is like a deck of cards. It's designed to throw you up the next hand before you've even played this hand. And so we're in this era now where we're outstripped by the machine and the machine is basically throwing us a melange of information on a daily basis and we're consuming it but we're not being we're not curating it we're not moderating it we're simply consuming it and the, it begins to work in the subconscious process my fear about this is <clears throat> that in losing context with printed material without the ability to touch and scan on a human level we're no longer able to process meaningful information. We are processing garbage, whether it has meaning or not. It's a hypnotic process. I think a key moment in the learning process and the process you described, Randy, was, and when I say this, I'm not casting any aspersions or doubts upon the integrity uh, of the founders of Project Camelot, and the, the setting, setting aside the fact that Project Avalon Forum also was where C Corey Good and that whole crowd yeah. manifested, which was an offshoot of, of, of Project Camelot. But with Project Camelot, what we saw, and this is how I processed it, it was a key moment because prior to that point, we all had a basic understanding of certain terminology like a whistleblower, which you accepted the term used to be someone who was actually inside a government agency. Well, a whistleblower actually, is actually a legally defined term if you look at the federal code. You know that. Yeah. That there's this very specific parameter. Catherine Austin Fitz actually brought me up short over this when I interviewed her. Because I referred to her as a whistleblower. She pointed out to me I am not a whistleblower. I was actually called out by a whistleblower. Catherine Austin Fitz spent a number of years in court, but it's a, it's a very definable thing. And so go ahead because I know where you're going with this. I just wanted to. Yeah. And, and also, the, you know, just now that you mentioned it, there have been efforts to protect legitimate whistleblowers who've spoken out about this bogus war on terror and all the abuses that yeah. have come about. But, but anyway, what's happened with project Camelot and going forward was, the meaning of the term whistleblower was distorted. It no longer was someone, uh, as Catherine Austin Fitz pointed out, it's a rigidly defined meaning of the term. It became anyone, and many of these people are exactly the same types of people you would see at the desert, a contact in a desert type conferences, anyone with an interesting story to tell. To yeah. be sure, she had people who I consider to be real whistleblowers, like William Holden, who I knew personally back in the day. But there were other people that she had on her program, which I do not consider by any stretch of the imagination to be a whistleblower. And so what happens is that kind of opened the floodgate. And I don't want to call people copycats because everyone's free to create content of their own choosing. But soon the internet and YouTube was awash with, with similar shows where people were claiming to be whistleblowers or claiming to have information from whistleblowers. Meanwhile, the real whistleblowers, Larry Warren, Bob Lazar, they were being raked over the coals, even by the UFO community itself. Seems the UFO community always had this cannibalistic aspect to it where they would devour their own. I mean, you know, these real whistleblowers would fall out of the sky like manna from heaven, but the first attack would always almost invariably come from the UFO community and established researchers. So anyway, we have this notion of what these whistleblowers have now become, i.e. the Project Camelot uh, uh, model. And so 
then we see a perfect seamless transition between Project Camelot and the Corey Good Antifa factions because the Corey Good group came into being in the Project Avalon forum of which you and I, <laughs> Randy, were both alumnus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where that all started. So again, we have this concept of a whistleblower and the meaning has been totally distorted. And what's happened with the Corey Good crowd is all these other people telling similar stories, it becomes an echo chamber. They reinforce each other's message. They, uh, they claim to have been all part of the same program. The real message, uh, the outrageous abuse meted out to real MyLabs, to real alien abductees, to real whistleblowers, the real harassment, the real mind control, all that is left by the wayside. And, and what we're left with is this glossy kind of feel-good uh, blue avian story. And so, which is not a threat at all to the system. And you can, al you can almost guarantee that the ones that are getting the, the most views, the most coverage, represent absolutely no threat to this matrix system. And when I mean the matrix, I mean this soul harvesting, soul recycling. I mean, I'm taking it up to that level. You know what I mean? And people like Corey Good and, and his ilk, they do not represent a threat to that system, right? And, and a quick point I want to make, and I'd like uh, you guys' thoughts, is getting back to the whole disclosure aspect of it as well. It's clear to me that, as I pointed out earlier, they're setting up, once again, this military priesthood. Uh, you have Tom DeLong and his spooky intelligence-connected friends. You have this uh, Mickey Mouse agency, which they keep talking about, the Threat Assessment Center, or whatever it's called, with its Mickey Mouse budget of $22 million, which your average half-right weapon system is more than that, right? right? Yeah. Coming out of Raytheon or coming out of Honeywell. Yeah. So what they want to do clearly to me is say, okay, look, the reason you need to come to us, i.e. the military, i.e. the intelligence community, is because you have these space cowboys over here talking about these 20 and back programs. You have these new agers over here who've coalesced and mixed with the flat earth movement, right? So what they're going to do, eventually it's inevitable. They're going to highlight and they're going to point out just the really fringe nature and, and the whack job nature of these other groups and say, you don't want to get your information from them because they're fake news. You need to come to us because we're the ones that, have all the real information. That's just my take on it, that they're creating, uh, once again, another priesthood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember Project Camelot. I was uh, got into them and remember the whole whistleblowers. And I, I was actually at that, they had a few conferences, the Awake and Aware conference, I think it yep. was called. Yep. Yeah, back, I went to the one, I think the first one in 2009, I think it was, right here in close to LA. And I went there because, you know, back then, you know, when Richard Dolan first came out, I thought I liked him, you know, a very grounded voice in this whole community, very factual based and all of that. I enjoyed his first book and went to various conferences, met him in person, we talked. And, I, and in 2009, he gave a talk at the Awake and Aware conference and really liked it because for the first time he publicly called out Stephen Greer, you know, at that talk. Um, about uh, Stephen Gear denying that there are any alien abductions and this is just all military-induced in and whatnot and there are no negative aliens. So I thought finally somebody standing up publicly to this you know, very popular New Age disclosure movement, so to speak. Right? So that's what also I put this clip in, the, in this UFO documentary I made with a friend, which is more based on, on the alien abduction phenomenon. And also many other, other researchers you guys are obviously familiar with who are amazing renegades like the late Carla Turner, right? For example, who already, yeah. who, who already warned exactly about like, she was so, I mean, just listening to her talk, so grounded and like fearless and also calling things out, right? And, and not being afraid and also saying that you cannot trust experiences just by themselves, right? And that's what's the issue of this, all these whistleblowers. Like I'm started, started to get confused, like who, who's speaking the truth and who not anymore. And then what happens and the real whistleblowers get them, you know, uh, thrown out with the bathwater, so to speak as well. Right. But then what I noticed over time, like, you know, I had, I would, I, I've, you know, over the last years, I've almost not kept up with all the ufology because I was just getting tired of it. It's always the same. 
right? I was, you know, almost wishful thinking like back in 2009, 10, 11, when I made yep. the documentary, like, oh, it will come out in more deeper ways. My lab finally we're talking about alien abductions. But then this whole new age wave came over and all of a sudden David Wilcock came in, you know, and, and then Corey Good and then Gaia. And then all of a sudden these conferences pop up like, um, what's it called, Contact in the Desert. And look at the lineup. It's just all the rock stars there. And even, you know, even Richard Dolan, since we talked about it on, a little bit on, on, the, on Facebook, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. Like he's such a nice guy. Right? He's like, a nice guy. He, he truly is a nice guy, very pleasant. And we talked in, in, in person and sometimes he told, told me things in person he wouldn't say in public. So I hoped always as more and more, but you know, I don't want to, I'm not a, about char character assassination or anything like that, but sometimes I feel people start to become then get so hooked in that scene or sense more about their career and image. Oh, and I have to make a living and all of this, right? That's at one point like, um, you avoid speaking out certain things or you just in without discernment agree to speak at every event event and whatnot and it, it becomes a circus sideshow right so it is just um so how can i say just you know um almost like uh just frustrating to to watch it unfold in that way because um you know i feel like there's always something that is, you know, what you mentioned before, Randy, about, you know, with the way we're taking information and all of that. Um, I feel what is actually happening, you know, that ties a bit more into my work from this more interdimensional aspect that the alien invasion is already happening through our own minds. And we see this even in yeah. the UFO community, you know, the wetico, you know, Paul Levy, the, the alien virus is working through people and uh, pitting people against each other. Right, it's already manifesting through technology. I mean, that's that's what I see personally at the quote-unquote end game or the next, the transhumanism, the AI yeah, agenda. Exactly, right? exactly. That's that's where it's all leading yeah. to. We're, we are willfully agreeing to it almost, right, with the yeah. way we're already engaged and with all the technology and whatnot. You can go the whole way back to the '70s and read Colin Wilson and what he was talking about with mind virus. You can look at the ancient tales of the archons and. What we've talked about on, on, on my show with a number of people about the fact that there is an extraterrestrial, off-world, interdimensional presence that has interacted with human beings. Why would we think they would not exploit the UFO meme? Why would we think they would not use that as an accessory to enter in and as a pretext to be able to operate in a way that it's almost open now. I mean, if you look at the testimony of people who are my lab survivors and people who have had ET abduction experiences and the testimonies of people who believe they were part of hybrid projects, whether those hybrid projects are off world or in world doesn't matter. We're still dealing with things that are ancient in nature. So giving it this modern sheen that we get from talking about nuts and bolts craft and aerial sightings, all of that is conflated with what I think is a phenomenon that's very complex. It's not one thing. Disclosure can't be one thing because there is no single source for disclosure. If the government comes out, James and I talked about this, the government comes out and acknowledges the programs that for instance, or even being discussed in these documents released by Richard Dolan and others on the Admiral Wilson documents, if we get to the point where there's confirmation on that, somebody has liabilities because there are people involved who have been damaged severely. There are careers and reputations that have been destroyed. And the business models that run in the background of, first off, the disclosure movement, which is an industry, and secondly, the defense industry, which, why are we surprised that we have a fascist system behind our government that is running what I will call a secret space program? Because I believe there is one. And that secret space program is not comic book material. It's basically a war operation operating over our heads. I mean, the proof I see for that is very clear. But disclosure is not single point. It'll never be one thing. 
these documents in the current disclosure to me feel like they're trying to boil it down into a single point disclosure just to throw us a bone and make us go away yeah exactly i mean that's that's the, the bone throwing thing that's why so what happened last week with again like bringing your vote topic into the mainstream senates people of the senate being briefed trump is being briefed bob lazar you know on joe rogan people get all excited oh disclosure is coming soon 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 but it's it's way too complex and i also wanted to address what you mentioned but i feel it's almost the elephant in the living room because you mentioned that the closure disclosure movement is, is an industry in itself and that is what the ufo uh, quote unquote movement community has become an industry where there's a lot of money to be made right so let's not forget that as well you know we see this you know with gaia and all these conferences and there's you know people have a certain self interest to be you know, to stay relevant, so to speak, right? So that's- Yeah, unfortunately, feel, this is, this yeah. is a slowly emerging area of inquiry. It's been decades, it's been centuries, probably. I mean, where it gained the updraft really was when History Channel began running the Ancient Alien series, which was a mixed bag. There was good stuff there. There was important stuff that was exposed, but it became a carnival, a carnival sideshow after a while. Because again, of the need to continuously produce content, get funding, find guests that have sizzle, and produce something that captures eyeballs for commercial television. And that was the market model that launched all these big UFO conferences that now dominate the scene, which have just become a giant harvesting opportunity on more levels than I think I even want to talk about. We've discussed it on my show before. I mean, go to these conferences, because I did. I, I did a conference two years ago in Houston. I did it reluctantly. I was basically the MC for the big room at, at uh, a conference in, in Houston, Texas. And I saw the harvesting that was going on there energetically, psychically, psychic yeah. vampirism off scale mm -hmm. and the opportunism there were some great speakers there there were some people and yeah, i didn't agree with them too much but i thought they were authentic but this whole thing now to me doesn't resonate anymore it feels like maybe this shadow puppet theater that you're, they're running really has run out of gas and that where we're at right now is that we have to begin to do the disclosure ad hoc as private citizen journalists again, because the data is out there. They're suppressing data. That's the thing about how can you have, since the 1940s, we have aerial shots of UFOs. We have videos. We have all kinds of data, hard data documentation and all of a sudden in an era where literally every person on on this earth is walking around with pretty much a high definition camera in their pocket we suddenly have no fresh video or photographs anymore really yeah that's pretty stunning when you think about the numbers behind that and yes, that's and to me that something's either cloaking something's either destroying the ability to harvest information or it is being actively suppressed. Mr. Bartley. Yeah, and just a, a quick point. Like I know this first segment will, will run out pretty soon, but th that's a key point, Randy, because for us private citizens, were we to come up with absolute 100% beautiful video of a close landed UFO, it's still never going to be good enough. So, I mean, it's to the point now where were I to come up with such a video, that's just for private, for people like you and Randy. <laughs> And other well, friends. that's what's happened. I can tell you right now, I have secreted on an external hard drive, locked away in a secure location, files that I've kept for years. And among those files are photographs that I have of ET contact occurring on the ground in real time, given to me by a person who experienced it. And I was told, no uncertain terms, this is not for public release. I can't release this. This person feared for their safety. They feared for their life. If I release this, they just wanted to talk to somebody. So I hold and, that and I understand that and in trust. I understand that. And there's a lot of lack of a better term, lack of integrity uh, in the field where 
this information is given in confidence for the reasons you cited, and the, these people turn right around and start blurting it out on, on the Internet and elsewhere. And, and the quick point I wanted to make, another elephant in the room, is the fact that the cover-up, as we know it, may not be, even be instigated and maintained by the humans. Because I've had discussions with people that I have a lot of respect for. Uh, uh, Jim Goodall, who's going to be back on my show soon, Mm -hmm. developed real sources in the deep black aerospace world. He even knew Ben Rich. And he pointed out, and I've had a similar discussion with others, that, you know what, we're not at the top of the food chain. And if if this ET non-human presence is determined to maintain the cover-up Ad infinitum, that's what's going to happen unless we, we ourselves take the reins and, and change this paradigm. So looking for this controlled government, which is not even in control of itself, to throw us a bone and uh, reassure us that they have the situation under control, that's not reassuring. And Once again, it's the savior programming. It's up to us. We're the captains of our own ship. We have to determine on our own what's important to us in the field of ufology. So that's, I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, well, I think we're pretty aware there's a harvesting program that goes on. And it is an interdimensional, it is spiritual, metaphysical, it is all of those things. And I, I think conflating it has been a disservice to the spiritual communities as well. I think they need to separate themselves from the charlatans and the people who are playing them for game, for money, and for emotion. The only other thing I want to bring up in this segment just to get it out is about TTSA, which is To The Stars Academy, which was founded, uh, air quotes, by Tom DeLong, basically funded by military defense intelligence operatives, as has become very clear. Uh, I have an article that will probably go up with this show that I've compiled that sort of points at the active agents that are operating in TTSA. Two of them, uh, Hal Putoff, who was at SRI during the 70s and the remote viewing experiments that were being conducted at Stanford Research Institute, a mind control operation, and the presence of Christopher Mellon, who is a former, nobody's former, uh, what was he, Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and an adjunct to Senate Investigations Committees. Christopher Mellon is a member of the Mellon family, the large East Coast banking family, old bloodline family. Christopher Mellon is the nephew of Peggy Hitchcock Mellon, who was the person who funded and fostered Timothy Leary and the LSD movement in the 1960s, another mind control operation. I think it's important to point out that these old line families have assets well-placed within media, within the government, within the military and intelligence communities for doing exactly what Mr. Mellon is doing right now. He's using the prestige of his, um, his former offices and his family and his obviously breeding, his ability to go onto TV on major news organizations and present what sounds like news, which is basically a synopsis of pilot sight, Navy pilot sightings of UFOs, which is the same story that we've had for the last 40 years. And so TTSA is funded. Um, I'm going to put out the financial report, their current year financial report, along with the article that I'm going to post. And I think people need to look at this and they need to understand that there's nothing new here. This is the same old spooks that have been operating behind the scene in UFOlogy for probably the last 30 years. They're the people who orchestrate people like Gaia TV and what happened with that. Um, I think we have to look dispassionately sometimes at the actors that are placed in front of us, people like Stephen Greer, Linda Moulton Howe. Um, I'm hoping that Richard can come forward with something fresher than what he's given us this time around. And uh, other than that, I think this ufology thing 
is kind of dead in the water until it regains its integrity. I agree. So we move the microphone over for the final word on this seg- segment to Bernard. No, it's, you know, for me, it all ties into what you just said. Like, you know, you said the, the UFO movement is dead in the water, but it ties even what you just mentioned about what is called a TTSE, eh? Uh, all of that, you know, for me, again, everything is interrelated. Nothing is isolated. And there's a whole bigger agenda that we're not aware of from a, you know, higher realm so to speak right and then you know like you made a very important point before uh, randy like when we look at this ufo phenomena alien stuff you know like obviously we can acknowledge the harvesting phenomena the negative alien agenda the occult forces you know what uh, but in the you know i don't see it in the i almost call it mainstream ufo movement at this point in oh, the it age it is like <laughs> that's literally what it is uh, you know, not only uh, denial, like Stephen Greer and others, or, or not acknowledging, but complete lack of understanding of, you know, a deeper, for me, like on a sense, basic occult esoteric laws, right? Or the way the world functions, because this is an ancient phenomena, as you just mentioned, Randy, before, that is kind of manifests itself depending on the zeitgeist of the times we're in. And now we're approaching this high tech. So it's going to adjust itself. And it's going to use humans you know use humans for their own uh, agenda so to speak by appealing to you know our wishful thinking the savior syndrome and all of that i mean it goes back to creation of religions monotheism and all of that so it all comes together and if we don't understand even universal laws or call those and understand the hyperdimensional aspect of these forces that are trying to um, you know that are harvesting soul frequency our illusion the emotional illusion all of that and how deceptive that phenomenon is you know which is even written in esoterica satan most often appears as an angel of light Mm. right and all these things that you know you cannot take experiences of bliss love i met this alien and oh my god you know it must be real because i experienced so much love you know what i just found out through my my wife laura like because i've i've kind of like was don't pay haven't paid much attention to the new age movement but there's this whole movement actually happening in the circuit valley in peru and laura uh, my partner she was there down there two three years ago um of like you know ayahuasca medicine journeys that's mm-hmm. becoming more and more popular yeah. and they're literally ayahuasca ceremonies organized with the intention to contact alien beings to make oh. contact to channel aliens mm-hmm. And there's a whole movement. She was involved, this woman, and she, I think, spoke at the, she was at the contact of Desert as well. I forgot her name, who's all into this, you know, promoting hybrid children, right? To call aliens down to yeah. impregnant her and others. And oh, I want to build. talking about very pretty yeah. girl, by the way. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Which yeah. probably helps the agenda. <laughs> of course it does. You know, and then she, my, they even asked, she was part of my, uh, Laura was down there, and they asked her if she wants to help them to build a center for these hybrid children, indigo children, right? So there's this whole movement, even using now, but I've also spoken out against you now this whole ayahuasca scene, which, you know, opens up yeah. doorways for these forces to come in, right? And through traps of agreements and manipulation, like uh, install themselves or create these contracts. And now that you have this whole movement of promoting hybrid children, hybridization of humanity as if, as if that's the way out, you know, which we know what the greys and reptilians have done for so long to, uh, to genetically engineer us, but not for our benefit. It ties into, they're almost turning the abduction phenomena, hybridization into a positive thing, which we need, needs to be done to us to save us, so to speak. So that's actually a good place to leave this segment because maybe it opens the door for us to walk through and do a little bit more detailed introspection into what you just brought up I, I, the spiritual side of this is so important the metaphysics behind it and the concepts that we both as a race and individually are all working on our own inner landscapes to heal and to reconnect and to become aware of these mechanisms and then to be able to move out of that and we're, as you like to say, through it. I say out, you say through, we say in. The truth is out there, it's inside you. This is uh, segment one. We'll be back for the second segment shortly for the patrons. And uh, do tune in. Uh, website offplanetradio.com. By the way, uh, real quick, both of you give your websites out so people know where to find you. 
uh, thecosmicswitchboard.com. And veilofreality.com. All right. We'll be back on the other side, guys. Thanks. Don't, 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 don't,